Hi there. Uh, I should probably start by saying I have exactly one of them with me. <laughs> no more than one of them. And it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's not a functional device. It's a mechanical sample. It has a little yellow. Some of you at the front may be able to see it's got a little yellow sticker on it. The yellow sticker on it means it doesn't work. Uh, but uh, I tell you what, I'll get rid of it. Um, if anyone's interested, I'll pass it around. Can I? Can you catch? There you go. Um, yeah, like I say, it has, it has probably zero economic value. So it would be lovely if I could get it back at the end. <laughs> OK, I'm going to talk first a little bit about how we ended up doing Raspberry Pi, uh, a little bit about the educational philosophy that underpins what we're going to try and do, uh, although I'm kind of aware that almost all of that material has been covered by Tim's talk. <laughs> so uh, maybe I'll try and skip over that a little bit. Um, give you a little bit of an idea about the, ec the economics, actually, of it, some of the business one of the interesting things for me is that I've never been involved in the business of trying to produce physical objects before. Uh, and I found that to be a, uh, an interesting journey. Uh, this has been a very interesting, uh, you might think last week was the most interesting week because that was the week when we were in the press. This week has actually been about 10 times as interesting. I could perhaps talk about one or two of the reasons why that is. And try and give you an idea about the future. Try and give you an idea. Uh, there have been some big changes for us in the last couple of weeks. And try and talk a little bit about some of, the, uh, some of the things that those changes are going to enable us to do. So Raspberry Pi has been something that I've been involved in for about six years. It has its origins in the end of my time as a PhD student at the computer laboratory here in Cambridge. Um, I ended up working as a director of studies uh, at St. John's College, which has always been my college, um, uh, director of studies in computer science. Uh, one of the jobs, a director of studies, for those of you who don't know the Cambridge system, director of studies is responsible for uh, arranging most of the under, undergraduate teaching at the college, uh, and is also responsible for interviewing um, uh, sixth form as pr prospective students. Now, I came up to Cambridge in uh, 1996. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I fell into the Cambridge vortex every year. I think I'll move away from Cambridge next year. Um, so I, so I, I, I fell into the Cambridge vortex in 1996. And uh, the sorts of people who I, I read computer science and physics as an undergraduate, um, and the sorts of people who I was on the computer science course with uh, were people who had been programming since they were eight. Um, you know, the vast majority of people on arrival in Cambridge, uh, you could assume that they. Uh, uh, they already knew how to program several machines. They maybe understood how to program not just in languages like BASIC, but also in uh, assembly language. They, un they understood one or more machines at a very deep level. Uh, what this meant was that the, one of the jobs of the first year computer science course was to take these kids, including myself, and uh, break them down and uh, convince them that they were imbeciles and knew nothing. And uh, the tool we used to use to do this is a thing called functional programming. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, standard ML. Um, and... Um, yeah, uh, I got broken down by it. Um, but it was a fantastic luxury. We didn't realize how lucky we were, right, that we could afford to kind of brutalize these people. Um, and <laughs> it was great. Uh, I was one of them then. Um, uh, so uh, we, we, could, we could do this, uh, and we could, we could rely uh, over a three-year course. You have about 60-something weeks of contact time. Uh, and at the end of it, you churn out somebody who can, um, uh, who can go on and go straight into a PhD program. Uh, now... By 2005, when I became a director of studies, uh, what had happened was uh, both our, our number of applicants had gone down. We'd gone from a kind of traditional Cambridge level of competitiveness uh, of, you know, sort of the best part of 500 people uh, applying for maybe 80 or 90 places uh, to under 250 people. So we'd seen this kind of precipitous decline uh, in the number of applicants. And at the same time, the kinds of things we could rely on knowing how to do had become much, much simpler. So uh, you'd gone from an environment, one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, cohort at St. John's, and in fact the guy who introduced me to my wife is a guy called Alex Evans, uh, who went on to found, straight out of university, went on to found um, the company, a company called Media Molecule, who produced a game called Little Big Planet. I mean, these are people who just go straight out into industry and do amazing stuff. Uh, by 2005, uh, somebody who'd done a little bit of PHP, a little bit of web programming would be a, that'd be a great candidate. Uh, I used to say to people, you know, if you want to get your child into Cambridge to read physics, uh, the, the way to get them into Cambridge to read physics is probably to get them to apply for computer science and then, you know, shuffle across once they're in the door. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's not a good situation. We were still able to find good students. I mean, the students we have now, are, you know, a lot of them are very bright. But it was just starting to get to the point where um, we, we were getting concerned. And we looked around for reasons why this might have happened. 
Uh, one of the things that we happened on was the fact that um, those of us who started programming when we were eight had machines that we could program on, uh, had the, the the equivalent of a recorder, right? So we had, our, we had our, our ZX Spectrums, and we had our BBC Micros, and we had our Commodore 64s, and these were machines you, you buy them, you don't buy them as a programming tool, necessarily, you buy them to play games on, often. Uh, perhaps your parents buy them for you to do your, your schoolwork on. Um, uh, and then you play games on them. Um, but uh, whenever you, when you turn them on, the first thing they do is they go beep, and a second later, you're sitting at a, at a, at a prompt that you can start typing uh, code into. And the vast majority of my contemporaries as a, uh, as a child uh, could at least write one or two lines of code. Typically, 10 print I am great, or print something slightly less decent than that, 20 go to 10, uh, and then go into Dixon's and type this into every single machine, and hit en then, then hit enter on all the machines, and then run out of the door. Um, so, <laughs> and not all of those people became professional software engineers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but some of us did. Um, so um, I think the point is that there was, uh, yeah, very much like the, the, the recorder analogy, there, there was a, a kind of a smooth curve. There was no, uh, uh, there was a smooth curve that starts with that program and ends with being a professional software engineer. And at no point in that was there, was there a barrier. Now, starting in the late 19, 19, let's say the late 1980s, those machines started to be replaced by two kind of, two primary movements. One was um, the games console computer games console, which had always been there, but, but which became much more dominant as the primary platform that children would use to play computer games. And of course, games consoles, uh, for a variety of reasons, some of them business model related, are completely closed platforms. They're designed to not be programmable because their, their economic model relies on you being able to extract um, uh, on you being able to extract royalties, on you being able to control the people who, who develop for them. So that took out the low end. Simultaneously, the high end, the parents buying you a machine to, uh, uh, to do your homework on end, was taken out by the PC and various other similar machines, which although they are still programmable, there is an energy barrier. They don't come with the tools. They don't boot into a programming language. Um, and so people, it's a very small energy barrier, particularly with the coming of the internet. It's a tiny energy barrier. You know, there's an enormous amount of documentation out there. Most of the tools you need are available for free, and it takes 10 minutes to download them and get them installed. But most people never uh, cross over that that 10 minute energy barrier. Um, uh, it's, it's like people live uh, 10 minutes from a, a fantastic playground uh, and, and they never bothered to go there. Uh, and this is, this is really bad. Uh, it's bad for the kids and then it's bad for the university. And then three years after it's bad for the university, it's really bad for industry. You know, go into a um, computer company now and look around and see how many 20 something year olds there are. There are not enough. 20, you look at the ratio of 20 something year olds to 30 something year olds, it's not a good ratio. Uh, it, we increasingly, my day job, I work for a company called Broadcom out at the Science Park. Uh, we find that increasingly we tend to be hiring um, experienced engineers away from other companies rather than being able to bring in a sufficient supply of new graduates. So we've got a problem. We've got a kind of a tentative, a hypothesis, a tentative diagnosis of, of, of what might have caused it. Uh, so we sat down, uh, and this was back in 2006, we sat, a group of us at the computer laboratory sat down to try to figure out whether we could build something, a physical piece of hardware, to try and, uh, try and paper, try and fill this niche that used to be filled and that isn't filled anymore. And we tried a bunch of things, and we picked ourselves, we wanted something that everyone could afford. You know, this was going to be an additive cost for a lot of people. So you know, if we, we couldn't ask people to go and spend another 200 pounds uh, on a piece of hardware, another 100 pounds. So we were very focused on what the cheapest thing we could build would be. And the price that we uh, the price we chose was, was the price of a textbook. Uh, was the price that I thought the textbook was. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that I'm very poorly informed even then. Um, uh, yeah, textbooks cost twenty five dollars, right? Um, and uh, so we picked twenty five dollars as our price point. Uh, we looked to see what we could build. And in two thousand and six, we couldn't build much for twenty five dollars. Now I subsequently left the university and went to work for, as I said, Broadcom. And it turns out that the sort of stuff you can buy for twenty five dollars if you're a cell phone manufacturer. Uh, is very different from the sort of stuff that you can buy for $25 if you're soldering something together in your study, which is what I was doing. Um, and we discovered quite quickly, we could build a, a, like a little Linux PC for this much money. So by, I guess, 2010, uh, we knew what we wanted to build. Uh, by the early part of last year, uh, we had built some. Uh, we had an interesting experience with the media. We went down to see uh, Rory Kesselman Jones at the BBC because a number of us who are involved in the, in the foundation have a history with the BBC microcomputer project ranging from me, I, I 
have one as a child, to uh, Jack Lang, one of our trustees, uh, who's actually uh, managed a lot of the operating system development for the original machine 30 years ago. Uh, and we really wanted to put a BBC badge on this. We wanted to put a BBC badge on it so bad, badly. And there are, there are reasons we couldn't do that. But we went down to see Rory Ketham Jones uh, just to talk to him about this. And he said at the end of our meeting, would you mind if I videoed, uh, just took a little video on my, on my iPhone and put it on my blog? And like imbeciles, we said yes, because uh, we didn't know what that meant. Uh, and so two days and 600,000 YouTube views later, it turned out we'd promised very publicly to build a $25 computer for everyone on the planet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> so really, since then, that was May last year. Uh, since, since then, uh, we've been uh, working very, very hard to try and, first of all, get the design of the machine finished, secondly, get the business model going, and um, uh, then thirdly, get them out the door. Um, the educational philosophy bit, um, I mean, I guess I mentioned it, I mentioned a little bit about it, and it's exactly the same as the Esperanto story. It is about uh, trying to provide children with a playground, something which is, we, we see this as being the equivalent of their bicycle. The, com the comparison between this and the family PC is the comparison between your uh, child's bike and the family car. It's a thing which is, belongs to the child. If the child, the child can mess around with it, can break it, if they do, it's not a disaster, they just have to walk around. Um, so <laughs> this, this, is, uh, this, is what we, this is what we're going for. We're trying to provide them with a bridge from nothing to the point at which they can uh, start using a real computer, the point where they can start using uh, you know, the enormously powerful machines, which you can buy these days for really not very, not very much money. Um, what this has meant is that you know, we've focused very much, where other projects in this area maybe have focused on formal educational outreach, we focused very, very hard on um, uh, just getting these into people's hands, on making, making these available to everyone in units of one. You don't have to buy 100,000 of these. And this has driven a variety of, of technical, uh, technical decisions to try and make sure that our, the minimum economic quantity you can build these in is, is, is very low. The big change for us has, across the, the history of the project, has been less ambition. Every, uh, every month or two, we become less ambitious. So uh, I think we started off thinking that we were going to have a very, um, we were going to have a very vertically integrated model. We were going to build a computer, and we were going to have a set of software, and we were going to have some tools and a curriculum and a program for outreach to, to educators. Uh, and this has all been stripped away. As we've, as we've um, uh, met more people, we've realized that almost all of these things are better done by other people. Uh, and this is... This is a way in which is kind of open, the way that we try to pursue openness has really, has really helped us. So uh, we're doing almost, not, almost none of this. And there are other people, so there are other people writing the software. The software is largely being written in Toronto by a group at um, York, U, York University there. Uh, a lot of the uh, educational outreach and teaching materials is uh, being done for us by a group, a group called Computing at Schools, CAS, um, who've been pursuing this for a long time uh, and see this platform as a way of, of getting their material out to a wider audience. Uh, we've ended up, by the start of this year, saying we're just going to make this hardware. All we're going to do is we're going to commission Chinese contract manufacturer to make the hardware for us, and uh, then we'll ship them in, in shipping containers, break them out and sell them. Uh, we got even less ambitious. The big story last week was we've, we've got even less ambitious now. We're not even going to do that. Um, we've been very, very lucky to, have, uh, to be able to persuade both uh, two large uh, British public companies, uh, RS Components and Farnell, um, uh, Premier Farnell, uh, to uh, commission the manufacturer and provide distribution for these devices worldwide. So the good thing for us is we can now step back even from the business of get, getting capital together um, and uh, commissioning the manufacturer devices, and most importantly, the business of putting these in boxes. We had, a, we had a little experience trying to sell stickers. Now, I didn't bring any stickers that I was going to, but we were going to try and we, we tried to sell these stickers. We sold 10,000 pounds in the last three months, we have sold 10,000 pounds of little tiny keyboard stickers at one pound each. And I have gained some personal experience, which I never had before, of trying to ship physical product around. And so <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted to have, uh, to have a couple of companies take that off my hands. So what this means is, uh, looking to our future, where are we going? We're going back to where we started. We're going back to trying to teach children to program. We've been able to strip away um, all of the extraneous stuff um, and we have no full-time employees, right? Uh, we've just taken on our first, we're just in the process of taking on our first full-time employee. By becoming less and less ambitious, uh, but also becoming more and more and more well-known, we've been able to get, achieve all of our goals in terms of the penetration of this platform. 
uh, set ourselves up in a position where we can now go back and start focusing on, on the educational aspects of our mission. I very much hope that over the, maybe the next, the next five years, maybe, we'll start to see this pipeline fill up. One of the reasons why people didn't appreciate we had a problem in this area was um, that this is, a, this is a pipeline. It starts with people learning computers at eight. Uh, it follows on into people going to university at 18, people going into industry at 21, people starting their own companies at 30. You can stop filling that pipeline. You can stop filling that pipeline, and you don't notice that anything is wrong at the university level for 10 years. You don't notice anything is wrong at the um, industry level for 13 years, and you don't notice the impact on, on uh, business creation for the best part of 20 years. We stopped filling this pipeline in the late 1990s. Right? We're starting to see the effects now. So we are, we are very hopeful that uh, Raspberry Pi, a bunch of initiatives like it, and the initiatives that our partners have in the area of educational software, uh, curriculum material, educational outreach, we very much hope our goal is to start refilling this pipeline. Uh, people often ask us, what would be success from the point of view of Raspberry Pi? Um, really modest. Success would be another 1,000 engineers a year. Another 1,000 engineers a year would make a, would have a trans in this country would have a transformative impact on, on industry, and it would have a really transformative impact, I believe, on the lives of a thousand people a year. So, you know, we're trying to do good things for the industry. We're trying to do good things for kids. Uh, we're trying to do this by giving them access to tools. So, please come and visit our website, raspberrypi.org. There you are. It's a plug. Please come visit our website, raspberrypi.org. Find out more about what we're doing. Um, let us know what you think. We'd be very, we're always very, very interested to hear people's opinions. We hear like one or two interesting new things every day. Um, come and check us out. Thank you very much.